Hello and welcome back to the final lecture on this course on chemical process design. In this second part of lecture 12 I'm going to introduce some typical items of electrical infrastructure that we can expect to see on a chemicals production site. We'll see that there can be a wide array of electrical equipment ranging from the combined heat and power plants that large chemical sites use to supply both electricity and steam through to the near ubiquitous installations such as switchgear and distribution systems. We're also going to examine electrical motors, both AC and DC. We'll see that large AC motors tend to be synchronous motors, which means that they rotate at an exact multiple of their supply frequency. We'll also discuss how speed control can be achieved for both AC and DC motor systems. The final aspect of electricity that we'll examine is safety. We'll recap key definitions of electrical zones that apply to flammable environments and also remind ourselves why it is imperative that human beings and electricity remain segregated at all times. So here on my whiteboard I'm going to put up some pictures of some typical items of electrical infrastructure that you may sometimes see on large chemical sites. And we'll start with one of the biggest items you're likely to see, which is a combined heat and power plant. Now, these are usually gas-fired power stations, combined cycle gas-fired power stations, and they serve two purposes. They typically will supply sites with electricity, especially sites with a large electrical load, but they will also supply steam, and this steam is bled off the steam turbines that you find within that combined cycle plant. Now, depending on the ownership of the site, these power stations might be owned by a third party, and there may be a contract of supply for both steam and electricity, or they may be owned and run by the site operator, in which case the, those contracts of supply will be internal to that company. Now, very often the power plant that are associated with combined cycle gas turbines is significant, and they may be generating more power than the site actually needs, and so excess power will be exported off into the local grid system. What you're also going to see on process sites are substations. Now these are areas of grid where you get step down in voltage or step up in voltage and also where you get switch gear as well and we'll talk about switch gear in a minute. So these are typically placed at the site boundary and this is where your connection with your regional supplier exists. So typically you'll find that the grid will be stepped down in voltage into your chemical site and except if you've got combined heat and power plant and you're exporting power, in which case you'll be stepping up electricity into the grid. You need very good security to these places because they are inherently dangerous areas. You've got maybe 275,000 volts or 400,000 volt rated equipment in there and you do not want unauthorised access because it's liable to kill people. There can be a bit of a noise problem. You'll find in these big substations you get a lot of 50 hertz transformer hum and sometimes you don't want that near any place where people can be working. So also on substations you'll find high voltage switch gear. Um, these consist of basic circuit breakers but you're dealing with circuit breakers that have to switch about 275,000 volts or 400,000 volts and so these should never be operated under load in case of an except in emergency. To prevent arcing and degradation of the switch contacts, you're looking at either vacuum-filled circuit breakers or oil-filled circuit breakers or gas-filled circuit breakers, and the gas tends to be sulfur hexafluoride. Once you've got your power station or your substation and switch gear, you of course need to provide electricity to bits of equipment, and this is done via cabling. Now you'll find both underground and overhead cabling on sites. So overhead cables are supported on trays, they're easy to access, the power cables can be cooled, but they also, provide, they also place headroom constraints on various roadways. For example, you might not be able to get cranes in to various parts of plant if you've got overhead cableways. Underground cables are often used instead if you've got areas of site where you need to get um, lifting gear in. But first of all, if there's any underground cables, they need to be incredibly well protected and well documented because the last thing you want to happen is for some contractor to come along with a digger and start digging into the ground to do something and cut a main power feed. Not only would it destroy the digger and probably the person in it, but it could also sort of involve catastrophic loss of power to your site. Underground cables, depending on the load, may also need cooling, so that's an additional consideration that needs to be made at the choice of underground or overhead. Cables will distribute power to distribution boards and distribution boards will be grouped together for specific items of equipment within plant, certain plant areas and you'll find distribution boards in dedicated equipment rooms. 
So here is where you have your individual circuit breakers or fuses for individual items of machinery. This is also where you'll get things like motor starters and motor controllers, especially the variable frequency drives. You'll also find safety gear such as emergency stops. These should be human accessible, such that if something goes wrong with a piece of rotational machinery that is being operated, it is very easy to quickly turn that piece of equipment off. So let's think about how chemical sites get their power supply. So if you've got a large or a medium sized site, you're probably going to need voltages for equipment up to 11,000 volts. And we'll see some examples of that in a minute. The plant may have to provide its own substation. This can be quite expensive. Um, you may have on-site power generation with a combined heat and power plant. And of course, this will also provide your site steam as well. If you're a smaller site, you can typically deal with a local power company, much as you would if you're a domestic user, and there's no need possibly for a dedicated substation. When you're thinking about site power supply, think of reliability, because reliability can often be very, very important. Because if you think of emergency systems such as gas scrubbers and other emergency systems that kick in in relief, you may wish those to be sourced in terms of power from a separate part of the power grid. So if you lose site power and you have an emergency situation occurring, that you've still got all your emergency equipment able to run. You may want a duplicate wiring. You may want uninterruptible power supplies or backup generators for essential items of equipment as well. So let's think a little bit about motors and let's talk about AC motors since we've mentioned all along that this is why synchronization frequency is so important. An AC motor consists of an outer core called a stator. So on this diagram on my whiteboard, that outer ring there is my stator. And your stator is a set of windings, typically done in three phase, but they can be single phase. And the aim of these windings is to create a rotational magnetic field. So anything within that stator is going to be affected by that rotational magnetic field. So very often in a, mo in a motor, you'll find you have a rotor sitting within that stator. And that rotor can be built either with its own windings to interact with that rotational magnetic field or of a magnetic material that is just simply dragged around in that magnetic field. And the speed that it's dragged around at is given by this formula here. It's 120 times the supply frequency in hertz divided by the number of poles and the number of poles are the number of coil pairs. So what you have if you've just got a lump of metal in that rotor is what's called an induction motor. The rotational magnetic field produced by the stator induces eddy currents in the rotor, which in turn induces a magnetic field of its own, and the rotor follows a stator, but it follows it at a slightly slower speed. It tends to what's known as slip behind the synchronous frequency. However, if you've got an active rotor, which we'll look at in a second, then that has a magnetic field that's generated in a different way, and that rotates exactly at that supply frequency. So here on my whiteboard is a picture of an induction motor. They're very, very cheap. You may also hear them called a squirrel cage rotor. These are passive devices. The rotor is just a solid or laminate block of metal and they rotate slightly below the synchronous speed. If a squirrel cage rotor gets stalled, it can result in a catastrophic overload and an overcurrent in the stator. And so when you think about the power supply to these things and overcurrent protection, you need to bear that in mind. Your synchronous motor has a wound rotor. You have a DC current fed into these rotor windings and that creates its own magnetic field. And the synchronous rotor rotates at exactly the synchronous speed. So you can't go from stationary to rotating to synchronous speed. So they often need some sort of startup mechanism. One way of doing this is to have a small induction motor on the same shaft that just brings the rotor up to speed and then when the rotor is at synchronous speed, then you turn on the set of stator coils that apply to the synchronous motor and turn off the set of stator coils that apply to the squirrel cage or induction motor. The good thing about synchronous motors is that they are very important for correcting for inductive loss, which is in power factor correction. We're not going to go into power factor correction here, but power factor correction can greatly improve the electrical efficiency of your site. Synchronous motors are also available in very, very high power ratings. So let's think about speed control of an AC motor. Here's that formula we saw on the previous slide again, 120 F over P. So we can change the speed of an AC motor by altering either F or P. So old AC motors used to have different coil pairs that you could swap in and swap out with switches. That altered P. 
modern motors will have variable frequency drives and so what you're doing there <coughs> excuse me is altering your supply frequency f the thing to always bear in mind about altering the supply frequency is very often you're having to deliver very high currents to these devices at very high voltage and so the electronics underpinning your variable frequency drive requires some very high power semiconductors and so that is why up until only very recently typically you've had to switch in and switch out poles and just cope with one fixed synchronous speed. In terms of supply voltages, here's some rough rules of thumb for you. If you've got a motor of less than 175 kilowatts, that'll be a 440 volt three-phase system. 175 kilowatts to a megawatt, you're looking at a 3.3 kilovolt three-phase system. And motor power is greater than a megawatt, you're looking at 11 kilovolts three-phase. Now let's think about DC motors, direct current motors. These are typically used in lower power applications and they use permanent windings in, case, in place of the stator windings. And you have a round rotor with brushes supplying direct current into that rotor coil. Now, because that rotor is rotating, you have something called a split ring commutator, which reverses the current in the rotor coils and hence the polarity of the magnetic field every 180 degrees. So the thing keeps rotating in the same direction. Now, if you plot out torque as a function of angular position for a DC motor, you'll find that it varies quite significantly. And so they are not constant torque devices, but AC motors are. However, for DC motors, speed control is much simpler and you just vary the supply voltage to the rotor. However, low supply voltages result in lower magnetic fields and lower torques and lower motor powers. Another way of varying DC motor supply is to provide a square wave voltage to that motor and then chop that square wave as appropriate to slow the motor down or speed the motor up. OK, let's think a bit about safety now. Let's think about electrical zoning. You will have seen electrical zoning before, but I'd like to remind you of it. If you have flammable atmospheres, you need to make sure that your electrical equipment is suitably rated to operate in those atmospheres. And we have three different zones which are defined. So zone zero is where a flammable atmosphere is always present. If you look at the diagram on the board, which is taken from HSG176, you'll find that the flammable atmosphere always present, or zone zero, is inside the vapour space of this storage tank containing flammable hydrocarbons. Zone one is where you have a flammable atmosphere periodically present under normal conditions, and that is the hatched area, and we can see the hatched area is around the tank vent. Zone 2 is where a flammable atmosphere is present infrequently under normal conditions, and that is just generally around the whole tank area and within the bunded area. So electrical equipment can be bought to operate safely in each of these three zones, but Zone 0 equipment is much, much, much more expensive because it's built to a higher standard than, say, for example, Zone 2 equipment. Let's finally think about another aspect of safety, which is the human consequence of exposure to electricity. So voltage applied across the body will cause a current to flow, and currents between 1 and 5 milliamps can just start to be felt. AC currents of 60 milliamps will disrupt cardiac rhythm, and DC currents between 300 milliamps and 500 milliamps will also have a similar consequence. So basically, exposure to electricity will stop your heart, and obviously, unless this is subject to immediate treatment, that is a fatal condition. However, most of fatalities caused by electricity aren't from electrocution. They are from what is termed arc flash. Arc flash is where you have a very quick and powerful and sudden electrical fire, usually due to an electrical fault of some sort, where you get intense light, intense UV radiation and intense pressure blasts. And if you recall our discussion in a previous lecture around the damage caused by pressure waves, that is one of the leading causes of fatality within, within arc flash. So you can minimise these electrical hazards by ensuring that you've got good insulation, that you're using appropriate voltage levels, that you're using what are termed residual current devices. These are emergency trips that will turn the power supply off when a leakage current is detected. But very importantly, that you're using correct working practices and you're ensuring that only competent personnel can access equipment. Also, it's imperative to make sure that all safety equipment works properly and therefore is regularly tested. So let's recap a few key points. <clears throat> it's possible to find a very wide range of grid equipment on chemical sites, ranging from combined heat and power plant at the largest through to sitch gear, transformers and then electricity distribution systems.
you'll find motors are used by power by chemical plants a lot for pumps for rotational kilns for conveyors and these are ac motors it's either induction motors or synchronous motors the speed control of synchronous motors requires variable frequency controllers remember your electrical zoning electrical zoning regulations must be followed in areas where flammability can exist and remember that humans and electricity must remain separated at all times